Good morning, guys. Thank you so much for tuning in again. I do have a Band-Aid on my chin, but my guest did not beat my ass today. No, I did not. <laughs> so. it, was, uh, it was a shaving accident. Oh. I fucking, I'm terrible at shaving, bro. I don't know about you, but... Uh, yeah, if you know, that happens. The worst is when I get, like, pimples or something, then I slice oh. open the... the yeah, See, I, I went, I, I did the old sideways. Uh-huh. Like, you go here, oh. and then you don't realize that you slice sideways. Mm-hmm. Fucking terrible. Yeah, it's the yeah. worst. I'd say something, but I have a feeling that my mom's going to be listening to this, so <laughs> we're just going to stop with uh, that thought there, Brian. Right. I, um, yeah, yep. I remember, yeah, last last time I listened to it, I was like, holy God, I swear a lot. I'm right. Like, I need to clean up the mouth a little bit. Tone you know? it down a little. <laughs> I feel you. Yeah. I feel you. Well, luckily, we're a... Uh, what do they call it? Uh, a safe safe space. Mm-hmm. You say whatever you'd like. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, man, you're getting ready for to do battle again. Yes. When, yes. When was the last time you competed? So, last time I competed was in Thailand. It was at Max Muay Thai. Um, and that was, I believe, March 3rd? Yeah. No, March 3rd or 1st. Okay. Um, and that was uh, pre-COVID when life was normal. Right. Um, and before the world went all to hell and everything like that. And that was the last time I competed. So, it's been about a year and a half, roughly. You know, um, and just super excited to get back into the ring for Lion Fight Promotions. Right. It's going to be at a different venue. It's at the House of Blues in Boston. Oh, dope. And, um, yeah, from what I hear, it's a good venue. I've never been there. Um, but, yeah, it's House of Blues in Boston, August 27th, Lion Fight Promotions. Pretty excited. We got a stacked card. You know, we got um, my guys, uh, Steve Walker is headlining the fight, fighting the number one ranked uh, in his weight class. So this mm-hmm. is like a huge, huge stepping stone for him. Um, we got Mike Shiana too, who's going to be fighting uh, for her, his first uh, pro title. Um, so I'm pumped to see him finally get his shot at that. And then there's a whole bunch of other uh, local guys on the card, a couple guys that are pros, um, Sean Schubert, Julian Wynn. Um, and then uh, a couple of uh, people on the undercard as well, too. A couple of amateurs. We got Alex Brown um, and stuff, uh, who I think is the only amateur that I know of that's competing on the card, but I'm sure there's going to be more. A few um, more, yeah. Yep. That's interesting that they mixed, like, uh, Amis with some of the pros. Mm-hmm. Not that they mixed, like, a pro fight and Ami, but I'm saying, like, as the card overall. Do they do that normally? Pretty frequently, yeah, because yeah, a lot of times, like, you know, it varies depending on whereabouts it is and stuff. But for the most part, you know, your amateurs are kind of like, um, you know, like the pre-show or whatever. And then, you know, then they air the, the pros like live and stuff like that. Like so people can see world round. And the other thing too is, I mean, a lot of times, you're, sometimes your undercard fighters are the ones selling the bulk of the tickets, you know, because like, let's face it. I mean, it's different because it's in Boston and they got all Boston guys on the card. Right. Um, So obviously we're selling the tickets. You know, it's like wherever the fight venue is, the people that live there are the ones that are pushing your ticket sales. Not so much, um, you know, people from like Kansas or something like that. that They're flying them in, you know, like uh, the kid that I'm fighting is from Puerto Rico. So it's like how many people is he bringing up from Puerto Rico? Right, right, right. 20 max like that. (laughs) Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's dope. Is this your first time? Uh, I understand Lion Fight's a pretty big Muay Thai promotion. Is mm-hmm. this your first time fighting for them? or? So, no. No, it's okay. not. I fought for them both amateur and professionally. I had a, a quite a, a streak going with them um, as an amateur. And then had my pro debut. Things didn't go quite as planned. Um, and it's kind of funny because even now, I still, every time it comes up on UFC Fight Pass, people are like, you're on the intro to Lion Fight. It's me getting my fucking ass knocked oh, out like with the spinning back elbow and I'm like oh thanks yeah it's a good <laughs> <You> reminder <laughs> <laughs> yeah like uh, Catherine she messages me one time when she was watching the fights like you know wait for me she's like oh my god you're on the lion fight and I was like oh really I said let me see and then she shows me and it's like literally the part where I'm getting like whack uh, into the face yeah. and I'm just like and I was like thanks babe Thanks. <laughs> that is, I always found that like kind of, I don't know, I don't want to say funny because you're on the end of it, but. <laughs> it is funny, dude. You know, right. you, you got to be human and like yeah. laugh at stuff. You know what I mean? Like there's way worse things that can happen than getting knocked out on TV. Like, right, 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 right. Yeah. Like, you know, to some of the coolest highlights 
You're like, damn, that other guy got fucked up. Like, like you see, like, uh, the biggest one is Ben Askren just getting jump kneed in the head. Yeah. And me personally, I can never get enough of that one. Like, that one's just... Uh, every time I see that, I smile because Ben Askren's like a douche. Yeah. But, yeah. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> like, just to... And that guy's just got to see that all the time. Like, mm-hmm. all the time. Luckily, you know, yours is just kind of on the beginning of the yeah. UFC fight pass. Yeah, and you know what? <laughs> I mean, like, the way that I look at it, too, and, like, one of my things that I always tell people when they ask me, like, oh, what is it that you would tell younger fighters or people up and coming... You know, my thing is, I I would say, like, learn how to lose and get, like, used to bringing yourself back. Because it's so easy to keep winning once you get momentum. It's really freaking hard to be winning, lose, and then bring yourself back from it. Like, that's difficult. You know what I mean? And some people have the willpower to do it. Some people look at it as learning opportunities. Some people, like, they really get caught up in their, you know, their O that's attached to their record and stuff. And um, some people don't come back for it. Everyone's a little bit different. But that's what I recommend to people, you know, is, like, learn how to lose, learn to come back from stuff, and and learn from it. You know what I mean? Because, like you said, like, you know, kind of like Ben Asker, and thankfully, or at least I'd like to say... You know, I'm not that much of a douchebag. Um, <laughs> I don't think I you're even close. <laughs> yes, I understand uh, some people out there do think that I am, I'm sure. And that's fine, you know. But it's like you said, one of those things, like, we got to live with that. You know what I mean? Like, every day. And eventually, it's like, you just get used to it. Like I said, I laugh at it. You know? Yeah, yeah. Um, one of my friends, Flacco, actually, uh, he sends me a message, too, when he was watching the fights this weekend. He was watching uh, um, Chip Pollard defend his title and uh so he was um he was like yeah he's like you're the, the thing same thing and i was like yeah it's a me getting knocked the fuck out like <laughs> lol you know and he's like no no I'll do it and i'm like it, it is it's it's cool you know? yeah no that is great advice um one of the greatest things to see in sport in general especially in combat sports is when somebody when it happens in a fight mm-hmm. when somebody is like more or less in control Something happens, he gets rocked, the other guy's, you know, takes advantage for however many rounds or however many minutes, exchanges. And then to see the other guy, like, switch it up, make a comeback, like, that, that's how you know there's some high-level competition going on, that you have to switch your game plan and you have to fight out of a hole. Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <clears throat> you know, and that, that definitely happens. That's life, you know, um, and that's, that's the fight game. Like, sometimes you can have a certain game plan, you get caught or whatever, and you got to... You know, you got to change it up and, and whatnot. Um, and then, again, same thing, just not in a fight, but then also sometimes your fight career. Again, if you're getting momentum and stuff like that, you're steamrolling people, you're doing good, and the next thing you know, you lose a big fight like I did. Yeah. You know, and then all of a sudden you're like, bam. Like, it, it's not the easiest. It's not as easy as people would think. You know, I, would, I definitely jumped into the next fight after that. Um a little too soon and everything and right. you know and then I was I it wasn't even like the same fighter like people if you watch my previous fights and then you watch the, the second pro fight that I had for Lion Fight it's like who the fuck is this this isn't Magoo this isn't mm. the crazy aggressive you know you know guy that we know and stuff like that um and it took me a while you know what I mean it took me some momentum you know had a couple you know wins and losses and stuff like that but then finally uh, you know, the last two hour spiel kind of going over that and, and stuff, you know, I, I got my bearings thanks to some, some good people and everything like that and got myself back on track and everything. And now it's like, all right, cool. Like, let's do this again, you know? And, right. And it's funny because like, you know, I was talking to my, um, my friend yesterday about this, uh, you know, it's, don't get me wrong. I really, really want to win this fight. Like, really, really win it. Right. And I'm training my ass off. I mean, things have never been better for me with this. But the thing is, is like, if I don't win, I don't fucking care. Mm -hmm. Like, because I got so much else going for me. You know what I mean? Like, I have a team for the first time in 12 years since I fought. Like, I've been fighting for 20 years. For the first time... I've been fighting. I actually feel like my coaches not just want me to win the fight and care about me that way, but actually care about like me as a person. You know what I mean? Like right. they're the type of people that would be like, Hey, you know what? Like, 
I don't think you should take this fight. I think, you, you know, you need to get your mental game back or something. You know what I mean? Like, they're the first people to say that. And, right. um, and by the way, that's Pride Martial Arts, Coach Andrew Cornell and Ross Levine. Um, Shout down out. There. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. You know, no, seriously. Like, especially it's funny because, like, I talked to Ross and his fiance Maddie, about it. Like, I never... I had a fight in Thailand where I broke my face and all kinds of crazy stuff happened. I was not sure I was going to fight again. Like, I mean, that fight really scared the living daylights out of me. And when yeah. you have to go in for surgeries and stuff like that, and, you know, you're in the hospital room and you're spending overnights there, that shit changes your perspective. You're oh, like, yeah. can I even do this if I'm even able to? And, you know, again, like, it was just Ross really reaching out to me. and was like, bro, like, where have you been, dude? Like, you know, like, why don't you come have dinner at Lion Fight? One of the ones I went and saw because I still liked watching it. Yep. And I wasn't sure about myself. And then, you know, again, he got me back into training and everything like that. So it's like, I mean, you know, it, he's, you know, he's been just a, an awesome teammate. I mean, he's an overall an awesome dude, too, on top of that. I mean, he, oh, you he's know, an animal. Yeah, it, it, plus a great fighter and everything like that, but yeah. really just a good friend as well, too, you know? Yeah. And um, really just kind of helped me get back on track. And so, like, when, you know, Catherine and I moved back here to Rhode Island, I was like, I know where I'm training. I'm going down to Pride because, you know, same thing. Like, Coach Cornell, every time I interacted with the guy, you could just see that there was this like genuine cares about his people like doesn't again doesn't give a fuck about how many like champions or you know fighters whoever he has in the gym you know it's like he just cares about his body of students and right. he's like yeah you want to fight only one time cool he's not like oh well you don't want to become a world champion so i'm not going to train you like mm. you know treats everybody the same and stuff and so it's again you know all of them, like, you know, actually, like, laying out my training schedule and being, like, okay, you're going to do this, this day, this, this day, blah, 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 you know what I mean? Like, laying it all out and everything right. like that, like, it's, it's, it's nice to have that for once, you know? Right. And, yeah, so it's, like, I mean, I'm giving it everything I can in training every single day, you know? And then the other thing, too, on top of that, again, it's, like, I have my lovely, you know, wife-to-be, Catherine, um, you know, at the end of the day, dude, she doesn't give a shit if I win, lose, draw, whatever. She doesn't care if I, you know, She's stop down fighting. for you regardless. Exactly. Yeah. And, dude, if I got, you know, all of that, a team and, you know, a family and friends that love and care about me regardless, it's like, pff, whatever. You know, yeah. the win's just the icing on the cake. Yeah. You know what I mean? Anybody that thinks that coming back from anything especially something like, you know, getting kicked in the fucking face and go going through, you know, the surgeries and all that shit, the things that made you nervous to do it again. Mm -hmm. Anybody that thinks that shit is easy has never done anything hard. Like, yeah. they've never experienced some, some true hardship, which a lot of people don't. A lot of people are super content with mm -hmm. just whatever the fuck they're doing. They don't need to push the envelope or whatever else. Mm -hmm. But then when you talk about having a team and having coaches that care about you as a person aside from being as a fighter having a a wife that doesn't give a fuck about anything else they just yeah. want to be with you and help you that makes it all that makes it easier doesn't yeah. make it easy but easier i would think it, it does yeah. it takes a lot of the stress off of things and allows you to perform better right and the big thing and I'm, i remember last time we talked too it's like you said it's almost like a cheat code yeah you know what i mean because like now dude like all i'm focusing on is just doing the best that i can now peaking over the next couple of weeks and then going out there and putting on the best performance I can do. Right. And that's it. And you know what? Like, I feel confident it's going to be a win for me. And fucking not. Whatever. You know what? I'm going off into the mountains of New Hampshire for yeah. a couple of days after that with Catherine <laughs> and I really don't give a fuck. Right, know? right, right. <laughs> that's great. I just, I actually spent the day uh, on Tuesday hiking Mount Washington with my I buddy. I saw that. Yeah. Shit was brutal. You ever do it? I haven't hiked Mount Washington, yeah. but I've, I've been there and then also, um, so I took a train up there when I was a little kid. Yes. They actually pushed the trains up. It's yeah. like weird. Yeah. And then um, <laughs> there was a place actually where, uh, you know, Catherine and I, we just went to in North Carolina, like Tennessee border. It was in the Smoky Mountains. Dope. And we drove up to like, and it was like, I mean, you're in North Carolina and Tennessee, like, you know, in late May. Yeah. You think, like, I mean, it was hot. Like, it was, like, night. In fact, I think actually a couple places it got up to, like, 100 and something degrees. Oh, I bet. 
So, like, you think it's warm, and all of a sudden, next thing you know, we're driving up, like, to the tallest peak in Tennessee, and it's, like, fucking 50 degrees. We're like, what? At the top, right? Yeah. Yeah. Like, what the hell? And it's kind of, like, the same thing, like, with Mount Washington, you know? Like, because I didn't, I didn't, like, I know it's one of the most extreme weather things, you know, and stuff. Like, it's pretty intense, brutal. Yeah, dude, at the top, like, so I'll tell you, the, the last, like, mile is the hardest part of the whole fucking thing. Yeah. And then once... Like, uh, we'll say uh, 0.2 miles between that and the peak. Mm-hmm. It's like night and day temperature wise. And it's not even that far. You know what I'm saying? Like, you get to the peak and you need a jacket, like, immediately. Because it's wind, like, a fucking fast, fast, heavy wind. That's nuts. Cold, dude. Cold. And I didn't bring a jacket. My buddy brought a second one for me. I would have died. Yeah. If I'm being honest. Like, but I, I would recommend it. It's super nice. It's hard. Like, it's, it's a hard fucking hike. Yeah, um, I mean, I'm up for crazy, stupid things. Oh, you know, totally. It's dangerous, totally. So. That's why I'm bringing it up to you. Yeah, because <laughs> you know, when, yeah, you know, I'm gonna eventually do that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that's that. I've heard that too, and like that's one of those things that's deceiving. Is like all of a sudden you're like going along, you know, you're down at the base, and it's like 85 degrees. Oh, yeah. I'm fine. I don't need to bring a jacket and right. get to the top. And like you said, it's blowing like wind, and it's like 50 degrees. You're like, holy shit, <laughs> terrible. Yeah, it's fucked up. Um, so you were talking a lot about your fight camp Mm -hmm. and it sounds like you're uh, you know this may be one of your first times where I'm using science yes (laughs) that's a perfect way to put it seriously you know yeah it's you know um, the way I always did it before was just train hard yeah you know and train harder that's it train hard and harder and I always said it I don't think anybody you know, really ever out trained me. Um, and I, it, cause I remember like I would, yeah, I just, I would train insane hours, you know, and it's like, you know, three, six hours a day plus teaching classes at martial arts schools. Um, and then also I've been over to Thailand. I've done that for months at a time and stuff where you get up, you know, you run, usually it's like 10 kilometers, 10, 12 kilometers. That's your warm up, And yeah. then, you know, um, and then you spar like five rounds and then after that then you do you know hundreds of kicks and knees and teeps it's like you know again you train like six hours a day and stuff so I always did that and now it's like okay you know the way that my training schedule is is you know what I pretty much have been doing this has been the constant I don't think anything's going to change over the next couple weeks but Sunday I usually do a lift a little bit of light pad work you know kind of like ease into the week I don't want to kill myself right away Right. Monday, usually I go hard. I go up to, um, you know, usually like Team Link or something like that, or I'll do like a little bit of traveling. Uh, I like to get some work in with those guys. And then, you know, if I have the time, sometimes I went back and I would train, do a double session at night down at Team Pride. And then other times, you know, I wouldn't. So I was listening to my body Tuesday, just a, you know, bag workout pads. Um, Wednesday's always been like my hard night, you know, I go like, you know, three hours, good um, technique session, heavy bag session, then like back to the technique and then into sparring. Um, Thursday, again, we back off a little bit, you know, right. back to just the pads, and um, bag and pads. Friday, been going up to Hard Knocks, getting into getting in some work with all those guys up there. Again, we got, you know, Alex Brown, Steve Walker fighting on the card too. Um, going up there, getting working with them, and then Saturday rest. So it's like there's, you know, it's not just like explode, give it all you've got, and then you're gonna question how you can even, you know, make it through life the next week. Sure. It's like okay, hit, all right, recover, hit, recover, hit, and it's like every single week, dude. I can feel like myself pushing on that Wednesday. Like I know I'm a little bit faster. I know I'm a yeah. little bit stronger, and it's all the nutrition too that like I've learned you know, from the people that I've been working with, you know, I worked with, uh, John Amore, grown in strength, right. You know, he was Shout doing out. like all, yes, absolutely. <laughs> um, you know, I was doing all like my strength work with him and he was taking care of like my, um, uh, my nutrition end and stuff. And then right. when I went to team pride, obviously I saw the magic that Trisha Cornell works, which another shout out, um, works with uh ross because he cuts an insane amount of weight and okay. he's he's phenomenal like he still like manages to again like function his fights and not get gas so obviously i knew there's something there so now i've been working with her and it's pretty much the same thing that john had me doing which is nice to know because okay i wasn't fucking anything up and doing something wrong 
uh, you know, but it's just a little bit more in depth as far as the micronutrient like management goes right. and timing and everything else. So it's like, you know, with the nutrition and just again, that, like I was explaining where you peak rest, peak rest, instead of just going balls to the walls all the time and killing yourself, you know, and then you get to the fight. I've always had injuries every single fight, mm-hmm. you know, you've got injuries and then you, you know, you're feeling like crap and you're like, why am I getting gas? And it's like, you didn't peak. You just murdered yourself for six weeks or whatever yep. it is versus like this time again, it was using the science of, you know, peaking, resting, peaking, resting. And then the nutrition just really tied it all in together. And I mean, makes a big difference. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, so um, I know you also, your introduction to the martial arts was karate. Mm-hmm. Me as well. So the idea of a training camp, when I first started training MMA, mm. uh, was more or less foreign. Because when you compete in karate tournaments, there's no real training camp. You might get a little sharper on your forms and that type of shit. But mm-hmm. um, as far as training for the fights and for the competition, that was like more or less new to me. Yeah. So <clears throat> I've had... Two, uh, you know, amateur kickbox matches and an exhibition. Yeah. For those two amateur kickbox matches, I had camps. Uh-huh. And for me, it was like, uh, the, the hardest thing to get past was knowing that in so many weeks, you're going to have to compete against somebody. Yeah. Whereas on that exhibition fight, I, it was a 30 minute notice. Like, he's like, yeah. you want to fight? Sure. Cool. And there was yeah. no, there was no, uh, <laughs> those are sometimes the best yeah. ones because like you don't have a chance to psych yourself out. Mm-hmm. Like we're just like, I fucking keep yeah. doing this, you know? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And, and it's like, I had been training up until that point, but it wasn't like I was doing any kind of regimented schedule kind of like you are now. Yeah. Um, does, has that ever been like a factor? I know you've been doing it for a while now and, and you're way more used to it than someone like me, but is that. Is there ever something in the back of your mind that's like, you know, kind of eating at you while you're training? Or is it just like, we got a fight that's going to happen in a little while? So, it's it's gone in different waves, you yeah. know? Like, when I first started fighting, um, it definitely, dude, it felt like it was an eternity to fight, down, you know, fight day. Yes. Um, and then it started to get a little quicker, you know what I mean? Suddenly, those six and eight week camps didn't get so long. And then other times... Um, they would like uh, now. It's like it's kind of like it's just yeah. It's just there, you know. It's just there. Yeah. I mean, it's not, and again, it's not like murdering myself. So like you know, in training, like to the point where I'm you know struggling to work or do anything else, uh, you know. So it's it's a little easier now. But at the same time, like you know, it's it's also I feel like just because I'm older, you know what I mean. There's a difference when you're 15 years old versus 27 years old. There's a a big difference, you know what I mean? Like sure. a one week is is a different time frame. Sure. You know, so I think also it has to do with that a little bit that I'm getting older. Like even now, I'm like, I can't believe it's already been like, you know, a year and a half since I last fought versus like before that I'd feel like, you know, half my lifetime or something. Now it's like, you know. Right. Um, but yeah, it's, you know, and plus my attitude too, and I think this kind of comes from the traditional martial arts background was I'm always trying to do something to improve myself, no matter yes. what it was. Like, even through the whole COVID quarantine, I was still getting in training with people. But I took that time to kind of focus more on my strength and conditioning because I hadn't in, right. in forever. So, it's kind of like, not that I'm always in training camp. Because all training camp is, is, I mean, if you are smart about it, it's just peaking yourself. That's it. Sure. You know, you're just trying to peak. So, that's where you're going to be at your optimal. And you can't always peak you know again you're gonna dip a little bit you know Mm -hmm. um it's like john you know explains as far as like you know strength training you tear apart your muscle fibers in the workout and then you have to give yourself the time to rest and recover and repair afterwards so if you do a really hard workout that means you ripped your body apart pretty good so you got to give it a day to rest whereas if you go and work out the next day you're just hurting yourself even more Um, so where I'm kind of going with this whole long rant thing is, you know, like I said, that's all fight is. You're just basically kind of like breaking your body down, letting yourself doing that over and over. So you peak at the best, you know? Um, and honestly, again, like, I mean, I, I consider myself a martial artist. Like I'm always training to improve. Even when I do retire from fighting one day, I'm still going to be training to get better. Right. And still going to be practicing every single day. You know, the only difference is I'll 
hopefully be one of those like 60 year olds that's gonna be like damn I can kick my 30 year old ass like yeah, what the yeah. hell too bad I wasn't in shape you know <laughs> <laughs> right yeah I mean that's that's uh, the best guys are the ones who are always training it just so happens that when a fight comes now it's like alright we train specific for you know maybe uh you train specific for the opponent. I don't know if everybody right. does. I know, I know there's like a kind of a thing like the gangsta ass fighters are like, nah, I just train to fight. It's like, you're kind of stupid. I mean, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? More or less. Yeah. You know, like it, it's, it, in my mind at least, I've never had to train specific for an opponent. Mm -hmm. But it seems like it would make sense to do some homework, to do some studying and, and put together some of your strengths to where their weaknesses are a absolutely and yeah. that's that's another big difference in this camp because before like people would I never watched any tape on sure. fighters I never saw anything and that was also like one of those things too like where you know again like there's a lot of like mental stuff that happens with fighting and so I, I'd never like look up my opponent and never know what their style was I kind of was trying to be one of those like gangster people because yeah. the way that you know certain people that, you know, taught me and everything, that's what they, they did, you know, and, and it's like, and then the Thai style of training is just show up and fight, like, you know, right. don't watch tape, don't, you know. Doesn't matter. Yeah, so, you know, and the thing is, the ties. I mean, when you have 200 plus fights, you usually get pretty freaking good at figuring people out on the dot. That so they sense, don't right. need to necessarily watch, you know, film or anything like that. Right. But, you know, if if someone was to come up to you and be like, hey, like, blah, 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 like, give you a little insight, of course that's helpful, you right. know? And they do that actually, too, in, in Thailand. The gamblers will go over and try and tell you things in your corner oh, to sway the fight a certain way. So they'll be like, hey, this kid likes knees and elbows, so I have money on you, so stay away from the clinch, you know? <laughs> yeah. Or sometimes they have money on the other guy, so they come over to you and say, oh, he has weak clinch, really, when he has a strong clinch, and they're trying to fuck with you. So you can't yeah, really yeah. ever you know, depend on them, you know, luckily I don't speak that great of Thai or anything <laughs> like that. Um, and none of my corners really, well, actually one of them did one time screw me over, but, uh, you know, none of them really ever screwed me over or anything like that. Listen to external influences. Right. You know, will um, corners do that? Will they like have bets on the other guy or so? Does oh, some absolutely. shady shit happen yeah, like that? Absolutely. absolutely. Oh, man. If they can make a, a dollar or whatever, they would <laughs> definitely do that. Some of them will, you know? Yeah. 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 Um, I didn't have someone do that to me one time, but I had, you know, one of my fight. it was actually a fight where I got my face broken. My yeah. corner wasn't really helpful. All they just kept yelling was, you kick power, you hit power. <laughs> that was it. Freaking eye was like, you know, I couldn't see out one eye. It's like hanging out of my head. You know, this big bald headed guy grew up. You hit power, you kick power, you yeah. no scared, you no power. Like, <laughs> Thanks, coach. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah, it's, uh, it's always a bad sign when you see a coach not really saying anything in terms of technical advice. Yeah. Like, it really only works when, uh, what was it, Sugar Ray Leonard, when he's sitting down and he's losing, and his mm -hmm. coach says, you're blowing it, kid, in the 15th round, and he goes and knocks out the guy. Like, right. I think that's the only time it's ever worked. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't really, th again, everyone's different, but I, you know, from my own personal experiences, yeah. being scolded, being scolded in the ring does not help me. Right. They, they did that to um, that girl, Valerie Lareda in uh, Bellator. Really? So there's a, there's a video that's been going around of her coach. I don't know who exactly her coach is. I think she trains at AKA or something. Okay. Or uh, to American Top Team. And um, the coach is just like, I mean, in his defense, she was kind of putting on a shit show. Mm -hmm. But he's just like berating her. Like, you got to stop with this bullshit. You got to stop this and that. And she's, like, kind of listening, but not really, like, looking off off to the side. So it was, like, a weird thing. But it was an example of that. It was, like, yeah, this coach is kind of just shitting on this girl, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. I mean, and you never know what's going on behind the scenes between fighters and That's coaches true. and stuff. Yeah. But at the same time, like, you know, everyone's different. I mean, some people, you know, they like to be slapped in the face before they fight. Some yeah. people need to be talked like that. I'm definitely not one of those people. Right. That's um, a good point. Some That does work for some people. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Uh, yeah. And then it's, you know, and it's also different too. Like, you need to... I feel like, at least on my level, you know, like a, a higher level, you need to be able to communicate both ways. Right. Because, 
like, for example, if I have coaches that are telling me to, um, you know, let's say teep, and okay, keep your distance, keep using your teeps and your push kicks, and every time I'm teeping this guy, he's fucking punching me in the face. Right. Or he's like really reading me well and stepping back and boom, boom, boom. My coach is like, why aren't you teeping? And come on, like you need a teep. You know, I need to tell him like, hey, listen, I'm having some trouble gauging the distance. The teep's not working for me. And depending on the coach, I mean, some coaches, they'll just see it. Some people really want you, you know what I mean? But yeah, it's yeah, like, because, yeah. you know, they, is, you know, your your corpsman is, is so important and stuff. But they don't know what it's like to be in there and feel that other person's strength, speed, power, and all that stuff. Sometimes shots don't look like they hurt a lot, and they do. Right. Other times, shots look like they hit and they hurt, but they don't do shit. They you know don't. what I mean? Like, it, so you gotta like it's it's a two way communication. Plus, you only get a minute break, so it's like for me, I've only cornered a few fighters, but I always feel like less is more less is more mm-hmm. you know like try not to be like okay well when he does this and blah 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 you're gonna do this just be like okay i need you to throw your right hand more that's it you know something right. really simple or block the low kicks block the low kicks like just really simple sure and it's like i found that with the good people that i had in thailand that was the nice thing about the language barrier they couldn't say much so mm-hmm. it's like i only got like you know one thing like uh one of them was um when I fought this uh, guy who was a southpaw, and they were just like, kick right, you, punch, 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 kick right, kick right body. And I'm like, okay, Easy. kick right. Easy. And, then he, and then he kept kneeing me with his left knee. <coughs> so they were like, stay, no, 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 no clinch, no, no left knee, you block, block knee. So I'm like, okay, like I kept. Simple. Really simple, you know? Right, and right. then like my last fight, Max Muay Thai, they were like, him punch body, you elbow. Okay. <laughs> Easy. Yeah, I think uh, what happens is some coaches, um, they probably have too much faith in their game plan mm-hmm. where maybe they don't realize when it's time to switch something up. Like, for example, you, you said teep. Let's say you go into a fight and your coach is like, we're going to use a teep a lot. We're going to teep the first round, round and a half. It's like, all right, teep's really not working. Your coach might, if, if you have a smart coach or, or an adaptable coach, I should say. Yeah might be like all right let's switch something up let's do this while it's happening he's kind of doing the numbers running the numbers let's figure something out yeah but then you get a coach who may be a little bit more stubborn just keep doing it keep digging that teep keep digging that teep and it's like uh, it, it might you know sometimes that works sometimes a stubborn coach is right see i told you you keep teeping in the body it works but yeah it's a tough balance balancing and act yeah and that's why you gotta you gotta communicate and i mean again i've, I've seen it in different fights you know you see good coaching you see bad coaching you see where you know, the coaches are, are giving, you know, good advice or whatever, and then they're telling the openings and, and everything, hey, like, when he does this, he's dropping, you know, that, or whatever it is, you know, or, um, you know, you're really off balancing him well with that kick, or same exact thing, you know, you see the, the coaches, you know, they, they, they're they they're talking about, like, these really intricate things, listen, like, when he throws the right hand, I want you to slip right and throw that up cut, hook, cross, too hook, much. low kick, and it's like, I've seen that, and it's no disrespect to you know lower levels, but I've seen that on like like local local shows with like first time fighters. Their sure. coaches are saying that, and it's like, what do you do? You, like your your fighter is having such tunnel vision right now, and they can't breathe. Like there's no way they're gonna remember all that. Right. You know. So again, you see you see different things that the, the coaches and corners you know tell them and everything, and sometimes that does make the difference in a fight for sure. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean the corner. The it's, incident that actually, you know, did, yeah, I mean, I was thinking of one that I saw where, you know, the person was trying to push kick and it just wasn't working, the height discrepancy between the two, and, you know, the girl ended up losing the fight because of it. Right. You know? One of the coolest uh, corner moments, I guess you can call it, that I've ever seen, you might have seen the video, it was going around for a little bit, um, Israel Adesanya was fighting some... Body, somebody that he probably ended up knocking out <laughs> but uh it was in a kickboxing match mm-hmm. and the guy you know goes to touch his glove he doesn't touch it this is after like the first round or something second round goes to touch his glove to go back to the corner adesanya doesn't touch his glove and stands in the middle of the ring and just stares the other guy down while he's sitting in his corner like adesanya could have gone to his corner but he's like i'm not tired at all i'm fine 
stands there and just stares at the guy while the coach is trying to explain shit to him. And I'm like, that guy sitting down is not retaining a single thing because he's got this other person who more or less is beating his ass. That's what, at least what it looked like. Yeah. <laughs> and like, I, I think I do remember like hearing about, I haven't seen that whole video. Yeah. It's um, cool as shit. That, that is, that's a pretty gangster move on out of Sinus part, you <laughs> yeah. know? And that's just one of those moments if you're the guy sitting on the stool, like you can't, that's where you can't let other people get into your head. Yes. You know? Like I remember too, that was like one thing I used to worry about. Like, you know, if, like, oh, my opponent's standing up in the corner, you know? Like, he must not be tired. Oh, well, I can't stand that. I don't give a fuck. I'm taking a seat. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, I don't, dude, like, I know in my, and that's, that's that, that's confidence. You know what right. I mean? Like, I know I'm not tired. I don't need to take a, you know, I'll take a seat. I know I'm not tired. Like, yeah, yeah, go ahead yeah. and stand there and look like an idiot. You right. Know? Like, that's what I would try. Don't get me wrong. Like, you know, again, I, I wasn't in that fight or anything, so it's, that's what your mindset. Would That's be. what I would try yeah, and do. Exactly. You know what I mean? It's just it's it's you know focus on what you're good at and strong, um, you know, and fuck the rest. I'll tell you, sometimes sitting down in between rounds is like, in in my second fight, it hurt me, like yeah. sitting down because it almost gave my my legs like, I, I guess time to rest, which is what most people want. Yeah. But getting up off of that was like oh like. So, it, it made it harder getting into the third round. It, yeah, and and that's the other thing too. Like if your body's conditioned a certain way, like I don't really have a ritual per se, and I don't have like any type of like fight day rituals, this or that. Like I have little things that I try and do, but I kind of gave up on rituals, and this is one of the reasons why, because a lot of times our plans go to shit with mm-hmm. what happens, and I have had. I've had some experience and I've had a lot of times, especially fighting in Thailand, where you're just like, what the fuck? Like, you're driving to your fight and the rim or the tire blows off your car that you're in. And now you're on the side of the highway and... You got to deal with that shit. Yeah, and you don't even know how you're going to get to the fight. So the next thing you know, you end up hitchhiking a ride and then you're in the back of the car getting your hands wrapped and massaged and you literally show up, jump out of the truck and they're like, go! Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. it's like, you know, your whole like listening to music and doing the, it just... <sighs> Doesn't matter. So it's like, you just, you have to learn to really just kind of roll with whatever it is. You know what I mean? Sometimes right. like, you know, and this is like a simple one that's, that could happen anywhere. What happens at the fight before you? You're you're doing your little pre ritual. You're doing whatever it is, and also the dude before you gets knocked out in like five seconds. They're suddenly like, "Go, you're up. You yeah. got to be ready." So it's like, yes. it's like, I try not to like again get caught up in like it has to go this way because if your mind has a process and you feel like it's gonna go that, it needs to go that process for you to succeed. If anything deviates, at least with my mind, if anything deviates off that process, I will mental fuck myself so hard. Right. And be like, oh, oh my God, well, this isn't going to happen. So this. So now I'm just like, I don't care. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's... Because that's it, it takes the stress off you. Yes. That's a huge point. Like, that happens to me. If, if some shit doesn't go, you know, more or less perfect, nothing ever goes perfect, but... For people who do get wrapped up in some of those rituals. Yeah. Uh, then, okay, I've got to hit, you know, pads for five minutes. Yeah. Like ten minutes before I go out. Yeah. Well, what if your timing is off? What if what if the fights goes, you know, not that fights go longer, but say you plan it out for the distance or whatever. Or maybe you do anticipate that the guy before he's going to get knocked out. Next thing you know, like, there's so many things that can go wrong. So, you know, you condition your body a certain way. And like you said, with the stool between rounds, I've had fights where I didn't want to sit because... Mm-hmm. Like, when I spar, I'm not taking a seat. Yeah. And, like, I'm recovering just fine. You know yeah. what I mean? So, it's like, again, it's, eh, you know, we'll see. Right, 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 right. It's like a, uh, like, an OCD thing. Yeah. Like, if, if there's one thing off, everything else starts to, oh, fuck, oh, fuck. Mm-hmm. And there's all these little problems. Um, so, yeah, not having, I was, I was more or less the same way, like, when I would compete in wrestling and that type of thing. These guys would have these long special socks with like bacon and eggs or something on them that was like the thing as like a wrestler yeah to get these cool socks and you got to bounce in the corner and slap your arms for 15 minutes i I was like oh it's it's my turn all right cool like or it's almost my turn let me warm up a little bit like i would obviously warm up not going cold but yeah you know you gotta you gotta do something but um to not 
ha- but then you have the other side where people are like, oh, I gotta have my lucky underwear and all this shit, and yep. it's like, and I and I tried yeah. to like get into that, but again, like you know, my dumbass would forget certain things. Too much shit could go wrong. Too I, many moving that, parts. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. So it's like if you just like minimize the amount of stuff that can go wrong, yeah, you're better off, right? You know, um, yeah, you know what I mean. Like it's just yeah. So I just you know like even simple. Yeah, it, you know, and, and again like. I remember, like, a big superstition thing was the Mong call and the Praji. That's a huge part of traditional Muay Thai. Don't get me wrong. I love it. I'd love to be, you know, if I can with all that stuff. It's great, but I've had... I've had a decent amount of fights over in Thailand where the fucking corners forget one of those things. And, like, if you ask certain people, they'll say, oh, They forgot that? You're going to get knocked out? Well, yeah, guess yeah, what? Yeah. I went out and knocked out the other guy and sure. I had freaking medical tape around my arm for the Prigi, you know, yeah, yeah, or yeah. they borrowed the promoter's mong call. Like there's, you know what I mean? And there's all these superstitions like, Oh, if you don't bow to all four corners, you'll be blind in one corner. Yeah. Um, or if you know, you do, you don't bow three times or you don't do this or that, like there is a superstition part of it. That shit only works if you believe in it. You know what I'm right. saying? So it's like the the more you can just kind of like... And trust me, I love the tradition of all of that. I love it. But it is a fighter, don't get wrapped up in it. You know what mm. I'm saying? Like don't think that, oh, like I have to have this or that. Because, you know, again, by like the third time where I didn't have the right Praji, I just eventually said, well, you know what? Fuck it. Because clearly if I keep basing it on this stupid thing that's around my arm and not all the training that I did in my skill set, well maybe I should reconsider things. Yes. Yeah, that's interesting because um, one of the... When I used to train karate, it was, you know, George Pizzari was the, uh, I guess you could say, founder or the guy who brought Kempo Karate to New England. That was yeah. like his claim to fame. So everybody thought like, oh, you go train with that guy, it's going to be karate, karate, karate. Like traditional, you know, you guys are going to do this and wear the white suits and, you know, all this stuff. And it wasn't like that at all. Hmm. It was more like, use what works, yep. know the lineage, but as far as tradition, eh, I mean, we're not going to do any... We bow, we kneel, take our belts off. That's as traditional as it would get. Yeah. It was, you know, we're training to fight, we're training to learn how to defend ourselves, martial arts, the whole thing. None of that other stuff matters. So when I started training in, you know, Muay Lao, Muay Thai, that type of thing, uh, and John... Larkin was telling me about like oh you know if you train if, if you decide to fight with Team United you gotta wear the what are they called the Prigi yeah. and the fucking hat <laughs> 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 yeah. you gotta wear those things and I'm like bro I don't wanna wear those things yeah. like you know what I'm saying it's just that's just for me you know what I'm saying it's, yeah. it's uh, an extra piece yeah. that I would like to do without yeah and you know and, and trust me like I've, I've fought a decent amount of fights with those yeah. pretty much every time um, since I started, you know, like doing Muay Thai. Uh, I think it was like my first five fights I didn't have it because the coach at that time, they didn't they didn't have that stuff. It just wasn't part of their thing. Yeah. And then again, I, you know, had coaches after that 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 was a big part of their thing. And, um, you know, I'm, I haven't really asked Andrew or Ross about it. I mean, the only thing I asked was the, uh, the Thai liniment. Um, and then I asked Ross to go ahead and give me a full body massage before the fight. And uh, um, no, that's like a that's like a half like little joke like between us and stuff. I thought you were being serious. I was I mean, like, wow, it, it what is, a good teammate. Yeah, no, it's, it's Thailand and a massage, but yeah, whatever. Anyways, yeah, so I asked for a full oil body massage. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I like the Thailand of it because this is going to sound weird, but it, it, um, it like kind of burns your skin a little yeah, bit. Yeah, but yeah. the idea... That they do in Thailand is it warms up your muscles, gets blood flow into your muscles without you having to like expend energy. Right. Um, Go out tired. Yeah, you know. So it just me. I like that burning feeling on my skin. It makes me like yeah, I'm ready, ready to, to go. Fight. Like that's one of those things like I like. You know what I'm saying? And yeah, like, yeah. You know, and e- but even that. You might not there bring might it, might be, forget it. There might be, um, there might be like kickboxing organizations that don't allow it. So you've got to be ready to, Adapt. you know. But the whole mom call and Prashi thing, the hat, yeah. <laughs> that, I don't, I don't know if, um, I, I'm not sure if Andrew does have it. I know if I had guessed correctly, I don't think he like, you know, makes it like a, like you said, like he requires like his fighters. Yeah. And again, 
I'm not going to stress out about it because I'm sure. still going out there and going to beat the hell out of this kid as best I can. Sure. It's like it takes time for you. Like uh, when I see a, a boxer, because it happens very often with boxers, they have the crazy shorts and the crazy robe and the gloves are all different colorways. It's like you had to take time away from you preparing to go fight another guy. You had to take time out of your day to go pick those things. Yeah. Uh, these three, I like that one. This one. And then what if they're like, oh, we don't have this one in your size. Oh, no. That's, again, something that goes oh, wrong. Lucky colors. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. It's To me, it was always strange. Like, I was always like, a, you know, go out there in some gym shorts and go beat somebody's ass. You know? Yeah, exactly. That's the way to do it. <laughs> you know, and, and, and that that is one of the cool things about, like, ties. That's why they don't get caught up all the time with certain things and however those spongebob tie pants you put up bro yeah i fuck with those <laughs> dude i i haven't pre-ordered them yet but i definitely got to get me a pair of those if you beat sure. somebody's ass in some spongebob pants i mean oh, dude, that's so awesome the only problem is is that most of the organizations that i'll be fighting for i think they require they have like promotional shorts that you have to wear but i will tell you right now if i get a chance to wear those Spongebob shorts in a fight, you bet your ass that I will. Oh for my God. sure. Oh my God, I would. I would too. I would too. Like, that's so... That's awesome. Imagine, like, your other guy's psyched Oh up. my He's God, I already corner. know what I would do. I, yeah. would, I would come out to the Spongebob theme song. Oh. Are you ready, kids? I am captain. <laughs> like, and the other guy is, like, all ready to fight, and you're just coming out with Spongebob fucking pants yeah. on. Well, that's another awesome. thing, too. So they asked me, like, what do you want your, um, they said, what do you want your walkout song to be? And I've, like, picked my walkout song, my first few fights, and then a couple after that here and there. But, and, like, one time they came out wrong, and I even said, I was like, oh, they picked the wrong song. But it's like, who cares? So, like, things like that can get messed up. Yes. Yeah. You know? Um, and speaking of which, uh, my fight song that I picked to come out to was um, Wannabe by the Spice Girls. Oh, good one. Yeah. That is a good one. Yeah. That would be nice. That's like uh, Mickey Gall in the UFC. He comes out to, oh, Mickey, you're so fine. You're so fine. You blow my mind. Like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's fucking great. And, and granted, it's like, but, like, that's the thing. Like, if it comes on, cool. I'll just jam out and look a little silly and stuff. Yeah, yeah. But I, I like to have fun when I do this. Right. Um, and if they play something else, then whatever, we'll flow with it. You yeah. Know? Now, is this uh, one of your first camps where you're kind of putting more of a focus on strength and conditioning? You're lifting weights and getting stronger and faster? Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. And even then, I I wouldn't say... I wouldn't say that my focus is more on that, but right. I'm just incorporating it. Yes. You know what I mean? But, like, for example, I was supposed to be doing strength training three times a week, but the days have flip-flopped here and there. I do it when I can. Yeah. And the other thing, too, is, like, if I have a chance to go hit the bag, pads, or spar, any one of those, I'm going to pick that over weightlifting. Sure. You know? Um, but, yeah. I, I think it... Uh we're a very long way from technique being your only asset. Like, yeah. I think there's some people who have found... Uh, how often do you see a, a, a college athlete who didn't go pro and they're like, I'll go fight. Yeah. And he can do it because... Or he or she can do it because they're an athlete. Mm -hmm. um, and they're knocking out guys who've been training for 20 years or something. Right. So... Uh, I think where we've gotten, we're well into an era now where being athletic and technically sound makes a big difference. It definitely does. And, you know, I heard, God, who was it that was talking about it? I don't know if it was um, Joe Valentini. God, I still don't know how to pronounce his name. Um, but anyways, uh, Glory Kickboxer there, Bazooka Joe. Okay. Um, I don't know if it's him or somebody else said, but they, they talked about how... Um, you, uh, they, they talked about how basically like making up the difference between like fighting someone from the Netherlands or Thailand that has like 200 fights or a hundred fights and you've only had like 20 amateur fights and, you know, five pro fights. Like how do you make up for that distance, that difference? And like if this person said, they said, well, I can be a better athlete than them. Yes. You know, I can be stronger, I can be physically faster, I can be in better shape, whatever it is. And that is, you know, absolutely that can make a huge difference, you know? Yeah. I mean, you can even see it 
um, you watch like a, you watch the old Muhammad Ali tapes. Uh-huh. He's beaten up. I mean, he beat up Sonny Liston right right above us. Yeah, he beat him up. This is actually the second fight, I think. What is that? First round. Yeah, the first round is in the second fight. Uh-huh. Um, but in the in the first fight, he's just so much more athletic. I mean, it's a st- it's a styles make fights type of deal. Yeah. But he's so much more athletic than Sonny Liston. Like mm-hmm. he's moving around, he's doing his thing. Nobody had him picked. Some young kid, and he covered that distance, like you said. He was able to, where he lacked in experience, he was able to make up for it in uh, athletic youth, but athleticism as well. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and that that can definitely make a difference. You know, as long and granted, you can't just go out there and only like lift and get stronger. You have to. Um, you know, you have to train the martial art so that way whatever it is that you're working as far as, like, gaining muscle mass or strength or whatever transfers over. Right. You know, um, for sure. But, I mean, I guarantee you if you ask people that were getting kicked and hit by me, you know, before, you know, I, before COVID and before I started training with John versus now, I guarantee you they'll tell you that there's a huge difference. Oh, yeah. I would you know? think so. Now... You're, you've already said that this training camp you're using a lot more structure. You're losing you, your words. You said science. Um, it, you know, it is. <laughs> yeah. I would, I would uh, assume, I know you're not anywhere near the weight cutting part of this, but I would assume that you have maybe in the past um, weight cutting. A lot of people, I understand, they kind of just wing it. Yeah. Yeah, that was pretty yeah. much it. I mean, yeah. so I at least had the water load portion correct which is where you like load yourself with like two gallons a day for a week before the weigh-in you cut it all out and then you just basically dry your you know dry yourself out the big difference is though is that what i do in the past is i basically eat like i'd eat next to nothing training camp get myself you know what i mean like basically eat nothing and then on the weekend i basically sleep and just eat whatever the hell i want have like a big cheat day of anything you know And um, to try and refuel myself for the following week. Uh, Versus now, it's like every day I'm eating enough to sustain my energy levels, feel great, not feel hungry or anything like that. So, you know, that's changed big time. Right. For sure. And Yeah. Well, I was just going to say that's um, super important the higher level you get because if you're able to control your weight the whole way through and uh, and do it in a healthy manner, you're obviously going to get... You're going to have a better performance. I mean, the guys that... uh, Everybody more or less looks different. But the guys who look like they're on fucking death's door and they're just black eyes sunk into their head, like, a lot of the times, they're going to... It's going to affect their performance. Mm -hmm. I mean, the guys that cut... You mentioned Ross. I don't know how much he cuts, but there's some guys who just cut. Uh, Max Holloway, he's the 145-pound champion. He walks Uh around at, like, 180. Yeah. Like, that's craziness. Right. Yeah, and, and, and that's the thing, too is um you know there's got there's people that do that and they get drawn out and everything and then there's people that do that and do it well yes. you know um this will be the second time well i fought in thailand i think i forget what the kilos came out to i think it was like 161 which i made i actually came in a little under uh it was awesome i like got to the fight i got to max muay thai and i like start i checked my weight and i was like i could have like a sip of gatorade and i slowly you know started drinking and stuff like that before the weigh-in yep um but this will be pretty much the lightest that i've ever fought at but yet it's also the best that i've ever fought at so it also tells you like hmm, i was doing things quite a bit wrong before (laughs) you know yeah yeah so you normally fight at what my weights were always 165. And you're fighting at? 159. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Which will also make a huge difference, too, because, I mean, I've fought some big dudes that hit really freaking hard. Sure. You know? Um, so it'll be interesting to see what it's like fighting at these lower weight classes, you know? Hopefully I can hit them and, you know, and Walk stuff. through that shit. Yeah. Because, I mean, <laughs> I'm walking around similar you know like 177 180 is yeah. what i'm at so if i can come in fight night at 177 180 pounds and say if my guy you know the guy that i'm fighting you know is like only 170 or 175 eh, you know i get a little bit of an advantage a little there. advantage yeah yeah that's like one of the big arguments with like major weight cutting because mm-hmm. there's some guys who they'll say it's legal steroids uh because 
you know, you, you walk in, uh, and I, I, one of the examples that I tell everybody all the time when I talk about this is when Darren Till fought Cowboy Cerrone. Yeah. And they fought at 170. And Cowboy Cerrone is more or less a small 170. Like he, Which he's, is crazy because he still looks big to me. Like, yeah. I, um, but anyways, yeah, go. Yeah, and, and he fought Darren Till, who was, who was a monstrous 170. Yeah. And he came in on fight night at 201 pounds. Yeah. And, and, and Cerrone is maybe 175, 170, maybe 180 yep. if he put weight on. Like... Because he was fighting out 55 before that, yeah. cutting, cutting a whole lot of weight. So you'd, you'd assume he'd be in 170-something range, 180. Right. So it's like, my God, Darren Till is another person. Like, there's two people fighting Cerrone. You know what I'm saying? Right, yeah. Um, and, and I think it's also perspective to what your body weight is. Yeah. And again, like, people that do that have a good, you know nutritionist or a good coach guiding them through that to do it and do it successfully um and the thing is though is that it's i think it's like body perspective too like as far as what your body weight your mass and size is you know it's relative we all carry about seven to ten pounds worth of waste in our body um you know waste and then water weight and stuff like that obviously if you weigh 120 pounds you know, and then you weigh 200 pounds, who do you think has got more fat to lose? You know, 10%, so say if you're at 10% body fat, a 200 pounder is 20 pounds of fat, that's 10%. A 150 pounder is 15 pounds of body fat. So it's like, if you weigh less, you got less to cut. Right. You know? And then it's also like, you have those big cuts, like we were saying, you're, you're likely to have a tougher night. Yeah, your cardio, your muscle fatigue, all that stuff. You're you're more susceptible, which is when you see guys like Darren Till move up to the weight class above. Dustin Poirier, he got knocked out at 45 a couple times, moved up to 55. Now he's going to arguably, you know, be the champ. So yeah, it, it's uh, it's a tough thing. Yeah, to to balance that shit. Definitely, and and it's you know again, it's one of those things where you really kind of need to know what you're doing yeah. and whatnot. Um, and that that's one of the main reasons fighters die. Yeah, I mean. yeah, and I know for me personally, with uh, as far as it's also the recovery afterwards too. You want to make sure that you're, you know, you're getting hydrated and you're getting carbohydrates back into you. You know, right. um, trust me. After this fight, I am. I even joked about it today. Like I love my meals. I had uh, buffalo chicken, rice, and broccoli today for lunch. That doesn't sound bad. No. And it was, I mean, dude, it was, it was great. I had three quarters cup of rice. Yeah. Ten ounces of chicken. Like, that's a lot of chicken. Oh, hell yeah. That's good. You know, and then, like, uh, it was, like, two cups of broccoli. Now, again, don't get me wrong. It was delicious. But I, like, joked with my coworker. I'm like, yeah, you know what makes this a lot better? Is if it was fucking mac and cheese yeah. instead. Like, yeah. So, you know, I mean, like, I'm definitely going to have mac and cheese pizza. Like, that's what I'm craving and stuff. Yeah, yeah. And it's not too bad. But... I'm not having that until after the fight. Sure. And it's because, again, you want carbs, water, and everything else. You really don't need a ton of protein. Mm-hmm. And you especially don't want fat because fat takes the longest to digest. Right. You know, you want something that's going to go through your system quick, get you feeling good, fast, and then, you know, don't have to fight. Yeah, diet diet for any athlete. I mean, it's it's paramount Which, over everything. Yeah, and again, you know, if... You know, if anyone does or has any questions or anything like that about dieting, I am not the expert. Sure. I would highly, again, recommend, you know, John Amore. He's what kind of got me into it. And then even, you know, again, I love them both equally. So it's like I want to promote them both. I don't want to say one, you know, but the other one is is Trisha, Trisha Cornell. Like, I mean, you know, both of them, just what they told me seems to be like pretty much the same thing. And then Trish has just gone a little bit more in depth with me with some of the micronutrient management, right? which gets more into the manipulation of, of water weight and all that stuff. Um, but both of them are, are great, you know, so if there's fighters out there looking for a nutritionist and stuff, hit one of them up and see what they charge for a program. Right, right. Mm-hmm. And tell them we fucking sent you. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, one more thing before we start wrapping this thing up. Uh, big news. The Olympics are going on now. Yep. Um, Muay Thai, I've read, is going to be an Olympic sport yep. next time around. Mm-hmm. Um, when you heard that, did it, did it, did it like, uh, set something off in your head? Like, you had, did, I guess my, point, my question is, did you have any aspirations? No. 
Okay. No. Nope. Uh, <laughs> so I gotta be honest. I think out of all the active fight, I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm excited. Yeah. And I'm sometimes I'm one of those people that's just oblivious to what goes on in the world and whatnot, or just the hype of certain things. Uh, and when people talked about getting Muay Thai in the Olympics and this and that, and I'm gonna sound kind of stupid here, but. I'm like, what the fuck's the big deal about the Olympics? Like, who cares? Sure. It's some event that happens every so many years. Yeah. And freaking people get up there and do this and that. Like, what about the fucking years in between? You know what I'm saying? Like, what's going on with this and that and blah, blah, blah. So maybe I'm seeming like, you know, this is the, the douchebag Brian that's speaking here. I don't know. <laughs> but I, I, I don't know. I was, I was never one of those people to like, oh, my God, it's the Olympics. I got to watch it. Like, trust me. I think it's cool, amazing what those athletes do. Yeah. I do agree with the idea of putting like an everyday average person to show them how amazing like these athletes yes. are. Like <laughs> that would be pretty funny if in you know again like the fifth place person still gaps like you know the the person that's you know just an average everyday person. Right. So I mean, don't get me wrong. It's like it's it's cool and everything like that. What these athletes do against the best of the best, but I never really understood it and. To me, Muay Thai has always been amazing. You know, mm. it's always been amazing. It's always been skilled. There's always ways to watch the most skilled fighters on earth. Didn't need to be in the fucking Olympics sure. for us to know that. Sure. Um, but I think that it's going to help out with the popularity. I think it's going to help out with the legitimacy. The only trouble now is what's going to be the scoring criteria. Because in order mm. for something to be an Olympic sport, it has to have a universal scoring criteria. You know, there isn't one for Muay Thai. Oh God, no. Muay Thai has some of the most <laughs> fucked up scoring criteria ever. You go to Thailand, people say, oh, body kicks and knees, you know, score the most. Or, you know, elbows and clinch scores the most, you know, or this scores the most. Kicks to the forearm count. Kicks to the forearm don't count. Leg kicks don't count. You yeah. know, it, it's, you know, it, it, it's a mess. it is, yeah. you know. And, I mean, I've watched fights at Lumpany and Raja Dum Nun where I'm like, yeah, that guy definitely wanted me to lose. I'm like, what the hell? He did amazing, you know, or vice versa. I'm just like, half the time I just look and I'm like, wow, both those guys looked amazing. I really don't care who won. Sure. It was a great fight. So there needs to be like some sort of scoring criteria. And then you have over here in the West where we're used to boxing and you watch these guys, they get punched in the face a hundred times, but they're eating body kicks, eating knees and everything else and stuff. And then all of a sudden they lose. And then people are like, why did they lose? They got robbed. And it's like, well, the other person showed more variety. So that's the first thing that's going to have to, you know, change is the squaring criteria. Right. Um, but I think, like I said, I think it's going to be really good for the sport. I think it's going to be really good for legitimacy as far as competing in the Olympics. When's the next one? Again, this, I don't even follow it. So when's the next one? <laughs> uh, it's 2025, I would think. Okay. So yeah. 2025. That's yeah. three years. I'm going to be 30 years old. My guess is I'm probably not going to be fucking going for gold <laughs> in the Olympics. You know what I'm saying? Right, right, right. And I got to be honest with you, I really don't have, even if I did have the ability, I don't know if I want to. Yeah. Maybe I would actually as like a last career thing because I'm kind of like planning on tying it all up in the next three years. Like I want to move on. You know what I mean? I want to achieve what I can in the next few years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, I got a, again, a, a beautiful wife to look forward to the rest of life with and I want to enjoy sure. it with her, you know? So yeah. I don't really know if I want to be fucking flying around the world. You know what I mean? Like and, and stuff. I, I, I've done a decent amount of that so far. Right. Yeah. yeah um, Because the... The most interesting thing when I saw that Muay Thai would be included in the Olympics is the idea that, mo mostly from the stories that you've told me, is how, um, I don't want to say illegitimate, but like uh, how spread out it seems. Like, for example, the stories you're telling me, uh, a fucking fire breaks out above the thing and, and like <laughs> yeah and you know what i'm saying like it seems like it's more or less i guess a better term would be unprofessional like mm -hmm. in a in a boxing event or, or a, you know mma event some shit like that happens everybody's evacuated everything's over like there's no guys in the gambling guys in the corner well there probably is in boxing but there's no gambling guys in the corner yeah you know what i'm saying visibly mm -hmm. that you can see it it just seemed like it's it's uh more or less an underdeveloped sport. Well, the way it is in Thailand, it's very much like boxing yeah. here. Um, and I'm not talking about like HBO level boxing. I'm mm. talking about boxing at its roots in America, getting kids out of the ghetto. Like yes. That's what, that's, 
that's what boxing is famous for. Why? How much does it cost to train? Super cheap. Yeah. You need a pair of gloves, a hand wraps, and a mouth guard. Like, what's that going to... Even if you bought, like, the most expensive pair of gloves, $1,000 for the gloves, yeah, and 20 bucks for the mouth guard and hand wraps, you know? Sure. Um, it's very similar to, like, that in Muay Thai because they don't really wear, like, shin guards. So they don't... Again, you just need gloves. That's it. Um, and they don't wear mouth guards, so there you go. They save themselves some money. <laughs> uh, and half the time, they don't even wrap their hands either. Just so. the gloves. All you need is gloves. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Barely. <know? laughs> so, it, but it's 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 a, it's kind of like a poor man's sport. It gets yes. them. It gives them opportunity. Yeah. And that's why it's so frequent. That's why there's gambling involved and everything else because it's a way for people to get out of poverty. Taekwondo in Thailand is very popular, actually. Okay. Um, but it's an expensive sport. That's like. What I've been told is that when you go to Thailand, the rich Thais train Taekwondo, mm. and then the poor ones do Muay Thai. Interesting. Yeah. Well, the poor ones would beat the other ones' asses. <laughs> <laughs> if we're being honest. For the most part, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's, that's super interesting that the contrast between boxing and Muay Thai, because I, I feel like I, I've thought that myself, because yeah. you see it's kids they start as kids. Well, and also in boxing, like, think about this too. Like, again, you know, most boxing gyms, how, like, most boxing gyms in this country, what, like, they're not expensive. Yeah. It's usually, you know, again, like 20 bucks to sign up for the month or something like that. Yeah. And it's covered in freaking pictures of whoever Concrete. the fuck, whenever the fuck fought, yeah. you know, in the gym and everything like that. And yep. it's, you know, dirty, disgusting, smelly, and half the time the coach is there, half the time they aren't. Like, that's that's a boxing gym. Right. You know, and again, it's super easy, super cheap, low affordable and everything like that. And what do they also say too? Kids that are getting in trouble in the ghetto, give them an outlet to, to put some aggression in. You know, yeah. put them into football, put them into a contact sport, you know, martial arts, boxing, whatever it is. You know, sure. and not for nothing, but... Again, you want to put a kid into martial arts, how much does Taekwondo or how much does karate cost? Well, it costs so much for the gi, so much for the gear, so much for this, so much for that, plus your memberships. Yep. You know, um, and then same thing, like, but boxing, what does it cost? Gloves. You yeah. Know? And then the other thing, too, with I think that's going to happen with the Olympics is that you will see a lot of watered down or like taekwondo people that go out and get a certification in muay thai and then they're going to say they're teaching muay thai and it's really taekwondo and sure you know what i'm saying so like i'm sure that there's going to be people trying to capitalize on it and teaching illegitimacy Mm -hmm. um versus like real muay thai gyms you know that comes with exposure too yeah i mean you uh i always compare uh, one of the greatest ones is karate one of the greatest examples i mean oh absolutely karate back in it's like even, like, back in the... I mean, I don't know what you'd call back in the day. But you look at, like, when Bruce Lee, Chuck Norris were fighting in tournaments and stuff. They were, like, fighting legitimate, you know, fights. Yeah. You know, and even call it point fighting or not, they were, like, punching each other in the face bare knuckle. Yeah. You know, like, I mean, it's... in, And, again, they were, like, kicking, striking each other. There was knockouts. There was people getting their teeth knocked out. Sure. You know? Um, actually, a decent amount of the karate practitioners that I know are missing their front freaking teeth. Yeah. I'm like, what? So the seventies, seriously, like all that time, like you said, it's, it was a legitimate thing. It still is a legitimate thing. Ross Levine, again, one of the best fighters in the U S yeah. Glory highlight of the year with his head kick. KO is a karate fighter. Oh yeah. He will fuck you up any day of the week. He started in karate. That's his roots. He's now fighting for a karate combat. So it's like, that's pretty sick. You want to tell me that karate doesn't work? Yeah. We'll Leona Machida, guy. when he entered the UFC, yep. was undefeated for years and still is a, a phenomenal fighter. It's just that people weren't used to seeing the karate style. And again, I'm not an expert, but like the blitzing in and out, the fast pace on both toes, footwork. Yes. And that's one thing that I love about Coach Cornell is like he says, it's not, he's like, is there a wrong way? No, it's not wrong. He said, but it's only wrong if it's the only way you know how to do it. Sure. Like me, I'm so used to Muay Thai. Like, I mean, I'm like an elephant in the room. You know what I mean? Like, I'm just like so flat-footed. I don't move around. And then one of my uh, one of my training partners who I really want to give a big shout-out to um, because I'm so proud of this guy is uh, Louis Acevedo because he 
you know, started with me in Muay Thai, great practitioner of Muay Thai. But let me tell you, dude, since he's been training with them down at Pride and really adapting a little bit more the the moving like footwork on both toes and stuff like that, and he combined it with his Muay Thai, that dude is, I mean, he's smaller than me, but man, he's like a slippery fish. Dangerous. He's so hard to, and the other thing too is he's strong for his size. So like when he hits you, like you feel it, you know? Um... And also, by the way, too, he won, uh, I think it was IKF or IKFA tournament, uh, right. national champion, too, down in Florida. So just, again, bragging about my team. There we go. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But, That's yeah, how you so, get better. Exactly. Teammates like that. Yeah, you know, like, yeah. And, but he adapted that different style. And it's like, you know, again, like I said, I'm, I'm an elephant. Like, I'm, you know, either flat-footed or, like, just on the ball of one foot. You yes. know what I mean? But I don't move around nearly as much as them. And it's worked for me and whatnot, but why not have that, be able to switch up styles? Because like I said, when I spar Lewis, one second he's like, ding, 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 like very Thai style. <laughs> and then once I think I got him, all of a sudden he goes, bah, 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 and then he's like speedy guns all of a sudden. And I'm like, what the, like I said, it's like a fish. It just keeps sliding out of your hand and you're like, yes. where'd he go? You know, and, and again, that's like, you know, karate, boxing base. So it's like, you know, and... And I know there's tons of videos of, you know, Taekwondo people getting their ass handed them by Muay Thai, but you take a really high level skilled, like I'm talking like, uh, like Ross Levine, Raymond Daniels, yes. you know, Michael Venom Page, he's another one from Bellator. Uh, they're all karate guys. Yeah. Now you take them and you put them up against a high level Muay Thai guy, like of the same caliber and weight. Yeah. You're talking about like a pretty evenly matched fight. You know what I mean? It's a it's a matter of styles. The two can implement their style better than the other one and negate the other one. You know what I mean? So like there's really I don't like to think of there being a more superior art. I think it's more in superior fighters, the individual. You know, it's who can again implement their style a little bit more. Funny thing about Ross, I don't know if I've ever told you that I competed against Ross. You did, yes, and I'm still like, yeah, damn, like <laughs> terrible, terrible. It was like it was my first time competing in the black belt division, and I had fucking no clue who this guy was. Just some big guy, like, and, and I was twelve eight, time, twelve 18. time sport karate world champion. Exactly, and it's that kind of tournament. It's like a point fight, more or less, you know. And I'm 18, and the school I train at, we don't train like point fighting or anything so i'm going out there and like a more forward kind of stance and i'm just getting lit up i can't move like he's just like whap and they're like point that yeah. front leg like bow and I, and and my one uh i guess moral win was at the end that he told me that i kicked hard so i was i was happy i was happy with that <laughs> yeah and that's all it is sometimes yeah. you know yeah yeah yeah, that was great. So uh, shout out Ross for teaching me that. Um. <laughs> and, and not for nothing too, like that also does like, cause I know that we've worked and we've sparred and stuff like that. Yeah, and it's yeah. like, it's cool to know that again, you know, I know I trained with Ross, but even so it's just cool to know again that like, and that should definitely give you some confidence to know, like, even though you might only have two amateur fights, like you still went out there and fought one of the best of the world at their, you know, their sport. And yeah, at that game, you know. Yeah, and I'll put a feather in my fucking hat. To, uh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it's, it's still lived to talk about it, you know what I mean? <laughs> right. Um, so we're going to wrap this up. Yep. You got a, is that a new sponsor? So actually, yes. Um, and I do want to give a shout out to all my sponsors, but this is uh, one of my newest sponsors. Um, this is Mad Kingdom is the name of the clothing company. It's okay. a friend of mine uh, who trained me for a brief time out here. Um, he's out in New Mexico right now, but they have... Honestly, super comfortable shirts and, you know, I, he's just been a cool dude. Like, you know, like he kind of like reached out to me and gave me like free shirts just to try out and wear. Catherine and I love them because they're yeah. super comfortable. And, and then also he saw that I had the fight come up. He's like, Hey, would you like to do like an actual official sponsorship? And I'm like, hundred percent, bro. Yeah. You know? So I'm pretty excited about that, you know, um, and hopefully can work into, you know, something a little bit more regularly and, and everything. Yeah. So, yeah, if you guys um, want to get some Mad Kingdom shirts, uh, go check out their Muay Thai collection um, and use the coupon code. It's hashtag Magoo, M-A-G-O-O. Uh, I'm pretty sure everyone knows what the hashtag is. If you don't, <laughs> it's the pound symbol, the tic-tac-toe board. Crawl back under that rock <laughs> if you don't know that. <laughs> exactly. Um, but yeah, use the coupon code. I think you get like 15, 10 or 15% off nice. on the order. Um, and for the, from now until the fight, 
all of the uh, the profits from their Muay Thai section are going to go to um, to helping me with the fight camp. So if you awesome. buy lots of stuff from them, it's going to help me out. And then also the coupon code, I still get, I think, uh, like some of the profit from that too. Right, right, right. Um, you know, so it's, a, again, and I like it too because I get to support my friend's company. Um, sure. I was trying to do it my best as I could, posting about it, telling people, buy shirts and stuff like that. Because, uh, yeah, we're all out here just trying to make our way in the world and we need each other's help. You know? Right. So yeah, it's a uh, one one sponsor shout out um, again. Mad Kingdom, check them out. And then also, uh, I do have and he sponsored me for a couple fights before, and he does sponsor a lot of local fighters. Uh, is Eric Burns Burns Roofing? Um, it's pretty cool. He used to fight like a you know amateur level, uh, but local you know any N E A K L I think is what it's called um, champ and stuff. So it's just nice for him. Like he still likes to feel involved. He likes to go to all the fights sure. everywhere. Um, and stuff, and he knows what it's like to be a fighter, having to travel, train, all the expenses, stuff. So this is his way of giving back. So Eric Burns, Burns Roofing, check them out. Um, you know, if you guys need a new roof or anything like that, go we got ahead. Got you covered. Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, the other one that's also pretty cool too. And at first, I thought it wasn't like a legitimate sponsor, but then I was like, no, it is. Is my uh, my own dad actually ended up sponsoring me? Okay. Um, Bogue Trucking. So I'm I'm pretty excited about that because it's it's cool. Like I said, I thought it wasn't legitimate. I thought it was kind of like, oh, well, it's my dad. But it's cool in the fact that my dad finally, you know, built a company and everything and has his own, like, business. Yeah. He can give money back to his son and, you know what I mean? Because, like, um, my family didn't always have a ton of money growing up, so I wasn't one of those kids where, like, oh, yeah, I got things paid for and stuff. Sure. This is his way of kind of helping out now. Um, and then, plus, I hope people realize, too, through the pandemic how important truck drivers were to the mm-hmm. industry because everything gets hauled on a truck. You yes. know, everything in this room at one point was on a truck shipping container and getting hauled somewhere. Um, yeah, so shout out to them. And then also I have a local um, uh, local sponsor as well too, uh, Ron Rudnick. Um, I worked for him in the past and stuff, but he's also given me, you know, sponsorship money to help with uh, costs and everything like that, you know. Right. And I still do have opportunities. I'm willing to work out anything, you know, with, uh, with some people. And though it's a little bit last minute, we can always get people um, on the sponsorship list for next time because sure. I'll tell you right now that people don't realize how little money we actually make as fighters. Yes. Like how much goes towards expenses and and everything else. Like it's, you know, it's not easy, but at the same time, um, I do it because I love it. Right. You know? There's no like, uh, there's no real commission helping you out or, ba- or back. It's it's the fighter. No. It's the no. fighter that's putting it together. Yeah. And, and granted too, my team helps me out as far as, yes. you know, obviously selling tickets and, and you know, um, what's the word, negotiating with the promoters and, right. and all that stuff. And, you know, and obviously they support me and, and everything. But, um, but yeah, it's difficult, you know. Right. And it's like, I really do do it because I love it. And I don't mean to knock on anybody, but, you know, there's, you know, I've seen, you know, certain people and stuff like that. They, they go into the UFC and they get some type of performance bonus. Sometimes, you know, they win. They get like a knockout of the night bonus and they make $60,000. Sometimes they get fight of the night. Sometimes perform. Whatever it is. And it's like... You know, when I got my face broken in Thailand, I was paid three hundred dollars for that fight, mm-hmm. and I ended up in and out of the hospital for two weeks, almost going blind, getting my face reconstructed. And again, I chose to do that, yeah. but it's like I'm just like, I would seriously fight anybody in the world for that type of money. You know sure. what I mean? Like just like one fight like that, like I would go through that absolutely. Like, they can fix my face again. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's so it's just you know I mean not to like sound bitter I know it's probably a shitty way to end it but yeah you know like well what I'm trying to say is I do it because I love it yes and because I you know but we're here to get paid motherfuckers we got <laughs> we got fucking expenses here exactly. <laughs> exactly and when you help out Brian you're helping out the show so yeah. if if you guys uh, need any of those things you need some cool clothes that mm-hmm. shirt looks comfortable you need a roof you yep. need a truck we got everything here for you exactly you know and yes. most importantly, when is the... We haven't said it yet. When's the fight? <laughs> um, so the fight is August 27th. Yes. Pretty sure it's a Friday. Okay. Um, I should probably find that out too. <laughs> Shit, did I book my hotel rooms right? Damn it. <laughs> That's another thing too. Hotel rooms. This time, you know, promoter wasn't able to cover it. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, like yeah. It changes. I had to pay $560 for a hotel Just room for in Boston. Hotel. Yeah. 
So, Damn. you know, yeah, exactly. So, like, that money gets eaten up quick. Mm. Um, and then, uh, but yeah, so August 27th, Lion Fight Promotions. Um, tickets, I, they're, like, pretty much sold out. They're gone, yeah. Yeah, I think they only had, like, standing room only left. I think, I, yeah, actually, I got a message a couple of days ago from the promoter. He, like, yelled at me and was like, don't say they're sold out. We still have, like, and I think it's only, like, 100 tickets or 50 tickets, like, standing room only. So yeah. I'm like, those are going to sell out. But anyways... Uh, yeah, and then if you guys can't make to the fight or, you know, somebody from wherever, uh, you can check it out on UFC Fight Pass, too. Which is cool as fuck. That's yes. pretty dope. It's like 10 bucks a month, and you yeah. get to watch all the Lion fights, not just this one, but ones after that, and yeah. you're paying $10 instead of $50 for a pay-per-view. Sure. Like the UFC. Right. <laughs> I think it's more now. <laughs> yeah, I, I can't bit. say anything bad about UFC because I'm on UFC Fight Pass. So. Sure. Sure. Well, all right, guys. We're done. Uh, thank you all so much for listening. Follow Brian on Instagram at... Mr. Underscore Magoo Underscore himself. Bang. For all the stuff we've been talking about, updates, he puts... Some, that's right. That's mostly where you... I do a lot of there. Instagram. Yeah, yeah, Something happened to my Facebook page. It still gets posted on there, but it's hard for me to respond back to people on it. Gotcha. I have an outdated phone. Um... Mike Triana has been telling me he's kind of been busting my balls ever since we started, like, um, when he included me in the online academy for a while and yeah. had me as, like, a teacher in there. Uh, he was like, bro, you need to get a better phone. And I'm like, I'll do it, and I still don't. So I think it's something Eventually. stupid. But, yeah, anyways, Facebook, I'm a little bit more difficult to get a hold of. Okay. Uh, Instagram is usually where I can interact with people a lot easier, you know, that are messaging me and stuff. So if anyone's messaged me on my Facebook page... I haven't responded back to him. I promise you, I'm not a complete douchebag. It's just, <laughs> I can't get to y'all right now. <laughs> sure. And uh, make sure you guys follow me. All the links in the description. Uh, follow the show. Follow my social media. All that shit. Subscribe. Like. Comment. All the stuff I say every episode. I was just about to say, like, make sure you follow you. Because, again, like, those financial episodes and stuff, there's a lot of cool stuff on this show that, yeah. like, you know, again, like that kind of gets overlooked by people, I think, sometimes. So, yeah, for well, sure. Thanks, man. I definitely appreciate that. And thank you for coming on. Yes. Um, this is uh, always great to get the word out about, you know, people doing cool shit. That, that's what this show's for. So, yeah, not even just fighters, but just like you said, cool shit. Everybody, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, guys, we're done. Peace.